Hi, I'm Roz Naylor. I direct the Center on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford University. And today I have the great pleasure of talking to Hilary Hoynes, who holds the Haas Distinguished Chair in Economic Inequality at the Richard and Rhoda Goldman uh, School of Public Policy at Berkeley, U University of California, Berkeley. So Hillary, it's our great pleasure to talk to you today about income inequality, about the role of the food stamps or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, as we refer to it, and about how poverty and food insecurity interact. So I would love to ask you some questions. You'll be giving a longer lecture, which people can hear. Um, but I was just curious, when you came into this field and started looking at issues of poverty and inequality, food insecurity, what brought you into the field? Why were you so interested? For most of my career, I've been looking in some way at poverty, and in particular, the relationship between poverty and the social safety net in the United States uh, in a domestic setting. And I think that the origins of my interest in that in part come from the fact that when I was uh, an undergraduate at Colby College, I had a couple of amazing professors that got me very interested in issues that were kind of couched in urban economics and problems of cities. Um, and I think that was one origin of how I got interested. And, and uh, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. Both my parents worked at the university, and my mom actually worked at the Institute for Research on Poverty, which is <laughs> an institute that still exists today and was funded and is funded by the Department of Health and Human Services as one of the poverty centers. There's another poverty center here at Stanford headed by uh, David Gresky. And, and so it was this kind of, I think, kind of in the ether for me uh, in terms of issues and interests in um, the disadvantaged population and, and how the policies that exist or could exist might affect those outcomes. So, so what is the connection just broadly between poverty and food insecurity in this country? So food insecurity is a relatively recent measure that the U.S. has kept track of, I think, in the mid-1990s is when we first started measuring food yeah. insecurity. And uh, there's a very strong relationship in the data between income and food insecurity. And so you see, for example, if a family has income below the poverty line, their risk of being food insecure might be four or five times as high as it is for a family with income above the poverty line. So in a way, that seems very, na you know, that's not a surprising correlation in the data given that the way that we measure food insecurity and what it's capturing is really about the inability of resources, either some combination of money and time, uh, that allow for having a balanced, a healthy um, uh, access to, to nutrition and calories. Yeah, a, a lot of us think about um, that food is just something we always have had, and you don't right. think about having to scrap your pennies to put food on the table, but so many people do. Is there a s different dimensions of this, either ethnic dimensions, age groups? Uh, is it go across age groups or certain regions that you see it more intense, the connection between poverty and food insecurity? Well, I think if you look at the data on food insecurity and look at the incidence of food insecurity across groups, you would see the same patterns in terms of groups that have higher versus lower risks of food insecurity would very much mirror the underlying levels of inadequate income or poverty across groups. So yeah. in the United States, one of the groups with the highest level of poverty and also the highest level of food insecurity is actually children. Um, the elderly ha tend to have much lower levels of poverty and, and lower levels of food insecurity. So you tend to see higher levels of food insecurity in those same groups where you, where you see high levels of, of sort of material deprivation. So that would be single-headed households, ethnic and racial minority groups, children, those with lower education levels tend to be the groups with the higher levels of food insecurity in the United States. So, so what would it look like for a child who is food insecure? They're in a family. What does their day look like in terms of meals or access to meals? I mean, are they, what, what are the struggles that they're facing sort of on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, one very important thing about food insecurity in the modern economy is it's not necessarily about a lack of calories, um, but it's about a lack of 
quality. It's about a lack of um, regularity. Um, and so the, the, the t 10 questions that the USDA asks families, which is the, the origin of what, how the USDA classifies households as be as food insecure or not, would be things like, have you ever skipped a meal? Uh, is there a time that you worried about the availability of food for putting food on the table and things of that sort. Yeah. So those are the kinds of characteristics that underlie the conditions of food insecurity for families with children in the United States. Right. So probably a lot are going to school without having had breakfast. Exactly. Maybe they get a school lunch in the summers. They probably don't. Exactly. So the, yeah, very, very interesting. So. A number of people will say, okay, we don't really have this problem because we have this big social safety net here in right. this country called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, or food stamps. Can you just give us the uh, elevator talk definition of what is SNAP and, the, and a brief history of when it came about? Sure. So SNAP is the largest food and nutrition program in the United States. Um, about 75% of the, the, the kind of transfers that USDA makes, in, including things like school lunch and school breakfast and so on, is SNAP. Uh, so we now have something like 45 million people who receive SNAP in the United States. It was very high in the Great Recession and is, is starting to come down. Yeah. So SNAP is a, um, you know, an, an income assistance program. You need to have income generally below about 130% of the poverty line to be eligible for SNAP. So this is a program that is for households who have low means of support. Um, and it's been around since it was started in the, in the kind of war on poverty period in the 1970s and has been available in the United States nationwide since about 1975. Yeah. In, all, in all places. Um, and the, you know, it provides a sort of a supplement to households' uh, purchases of food. So the average benefit is about $250 for a family. Uh, or if you work it out, it's four, about $4 per person per day is what the average um, SNAP benefit is. So, so do you think most of the food insecure people in this country are actually fully covered by SNAP? I mean, are, they, are, we, are we okay with just having these entitlement programs, or are we also relying a lot on more volunteer, you know, the food banks and so forth? How, how are those numbers coming out? Well, what we know for, for, through a lot of sort of consistent um, research and evidence is that SNAP does lower the incidence of food insecurity. It does not lower it to zero, um, and there are groups that for one reason or another are still food insecure or, or, and or don't, don't have access to SNAP. The participation isn't 100%. There are some groups who have income levels that are above the eligibility point that, that still show some incidence of food insecurity. So it, it does not lower the incidence to zero. Um, but it does markedly reduce the incidence of, of food insecurity. So you've spent a lot of time digging into the details here. What are some of the successes with SNAP and some of the failures that you've seen? And what kinds of impacts is it having, do you think, on child nutrition, for example? So the, to me, the really core interesting thing about SNAP is if you look as far back as the original legislation in the 1964 Food Stamp Act and, and all the way to today, when people talk about food stamps, they talk about what I sometimes refer to as the two pillars of what underlie this program. And one pillar is, this is a nutrition program. Uh, this is a program that is trying to get more resources to families and others in order to increase their spending on food and to provide a, a balanced and nutritious meal for individuals with low income. At the same time, it's also a basic subsistence program that's yeah. providing sort of key resources to families that have low income. And, and, and over time, the share of families on food stamps who have workers in the family is, is, is by far the majority of households. So yeah. in part, we have a situation in the United States where wages for less skilled workers are not keeping up with inflation. Family incomes are going down, are certainly not increasing uh, if you have an education level you know, less than a college graduate. And so what we see over time, I think, is that more sort of need to have the social safety net 
try to make up for some of those declines in earnings that are happening through other forces going on in the labor market. And the yeah. two main ways that that's going on for families is, is SNAP and also the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a, the, the, those are the two main um, sources of um, sort of supplementing earnings that are taking place in, in American families. So I think one of the success stories of SNAP on the first level is how important it is for keeping children and families out of poverty. So it is the first or second largest uh, anti-poverty program for children in America, and that's yeah. something that most people don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it, it targets people that are not the poorest of the poor, uh, but they tend to be very much a, a lot of working poor families, and it's very important for that in that regard. So that's, that's number one. And number two, um, as we'll have a chance to talk more about later today, um, the, there's, a, there's a sort of new um, series of studies that are coming out that are, that's trying to quantify the importance of SNAP and other elements of the safety nets is going on across other, uh, across other um, sort of areas and trying to understand the relationship between the availability of the safety net, particularly for children as they grow up, and the extent to which that in some way protects them or improves their outcomes, either health or economic outcomes in adulthood. And so we're just, I think, at the very beginning stages of trying to understand and quantify what can be some uh, sort of unmeasured benefits of the social safety net broadly that have not really gotten much attention. Yeah, that's so interesting. So it's really the, the long run benefits of investing in. Exactly feeding people in right. this country. So I can imagine right. kids that don't have enough nutrition to go to, when they go to school, aren't really focused on school and they probably do very poorly and, and don't take advantage of our educational system. Or the same right. with the health, have a variety of health impacts that might actually debilitate them over time. So as we have more gaping inequality in this country, uh, so many of the people actually that are on food stamps have two working, you know, parents in that right. household, and s many have had college degrees even, and um, but mostly at high school level, mm -hmm. and so you're seeing the inequality really panning out in terms of our needs over time. It sounds like. Well, it's absolutely the case that we, you know, there's sort of two dimensions of inequality that are important to point out. There's the the attention on on the very top earners, you know, the top one percent, and you know, the work by my colleague at Berkeley, Emmanuel Saez, and, and so on, that's really documenting the, the greater and greater gains in income that's accruing to the very top of the distribution. So that's sort of one side. The flip side of that is what's happening at the, <laughs> at the lower end, and that's, you know, sort of where my, my work is, is focused on. And, and you know, the, the story is, is, on the one hand, uh, we've measured poverty in America for now since the early 1960s. And the original definition of poverty that we devised in the early 60s is still being used today. The official poverty measure in America is essentially calculated in the same way as it was in the early 60s. And if you look at that poverty measure, the share of children in poverty, if, if anything, looks like it's sort of been increasing um, uh, since the mid-1970s, very much following the declines in income and wages for these low-skilled groups. That's very troubling and, and very discouraging, especially for many who have invested and pushed so hard for these expansions of the social safety net. But it, it turns out that that original definition of poverty was defined circa the social safety net that we had in the early 1960s. And in particular, it's a cash income poverty measure. So in particular, what that means is any benefits you get from SNAP are explicitly not counted as resources for calculating poverty by official statistics. So right. we've recently had the release through the census of a, a new poverty measure. It doesn't replace the old one, but it's, it's released in parallel to it called the Supplemental Poverty Measure. And that updates poverty uh, in the United States in, in particular ways, including counting things like SNAP and the Earned Income Tax Credit as part of the family budget, which it clearly is. Uh, and what you see with that and the trends over time is that while it doesn't lower the poverty rate to zero, there is still a, a very persistent share of families and children that are poor, but we see a little bit more 
the improvement over time as we've invested more in things like Medicaid, the EITC, um, and SNAP over the last couple of decades. So it's a slightly more optimistic, I think, opportunity to say uh, the problems aren't gone, but some of the investments that we've made do in fact show up in terms of improving outcomes. Yeah, and that's so, a, still a very yeah. kind of contemporaneous look. There's the issues of the, the long run impacts that, that also we're starting to learn more about. Yeah, so that's so interesting because essentially by providing SNAP and other entitlements, you're pulling that poverty rate down right now right. to some extent. Right. And that's important, right. but also in the long run providing the sort of basic services to keep it down. Right. So, so in short, I mean, if these programs are designed right and can right, reach the right people, you could be really reducing that income gap over time, which I suppose is what you're trying to do in your career, right. um, figuring out how to solve the inequality right. issue here. So that's, that's fascinating. And there's this incredible work going on uh, around the US right now. There are people that are working on Medicaid. There are people that are working on other aspects of the of the sort of social security, social safety net. And, and, and there's a very consistent finding of greater expansion in, um, in resources and, and, and protection, really, when children are young. And to the extent to which that translates into better completed human capital, um, higher levels of earnings in young adulthood, longer, you know, less healthcare costs, I mean, these are things that sort of um, quite quickly start to get chalked up in terms of uh, returns to an investment, which is a really, yeah. I think, the way our thinking will, is starting to move, yeah. at least in the research community. And we're hoping that it's uh, going to be getting out to the broader <laughs> policy <laughs> world. That's, that's excellent. Um, what are the biggest challenges, do you think, right now in terms of the success right. in that? I think right now, by far, the biggest challenge is the fact that there's a very large interest in Washington uh, trying to push moving SNAP to a block grant. So, so what is a block grant? A block grant is taking a fixed amount of resources and saying, this is what we're dedicating to this program, d di passing that income on to the states in order to essentially run their own mini programs with a, with a cap in the amount of resources. And one of the things that has made SNAP so successful, something I haven't talked about yet, is the fact that it's an entitlement means that it's a real quick responder when need happens. If you lose a job, if your hours are cut, if your income goes down, there's not a waiting list. There's not, you know, households aren't turned away because all the, all the money has been paid out. Uh, in public housing, people can be on waiting lists for years yeah, until yeah. Uh, spots are freed up. SNAP is an entitlement, which means that it's there relatively quickly. It also means that in recessions, it provides a sort of macroeconomic automatic stabilizer, which yeah. people have, have analyzed and examined before. So what we know from the block granting of another part of the social safety net, what's now called TANF, from what used to be called AFDC, it's basic cash welfare, is that it provided essentially no response in the Great Recession. There was not much reaction of that program in this time of incredible need. And so many people have kind of examined and tried to understand that and to sort of make the connection between the importance of having an entitlement and its ability to react in times of need um, and, and the limitation of, of kind of block granting programs that sort of have this feature to them. So I think one of the biggest threats to SNAP and the, its potential to uh, reach people in need and create the investments that we're talking about are these ideas around um, uh, block granting and, and, and limiting, essentially, the entitlement nature of the program. Yeah, sounds like they're so. being introduced by people that don't really understand the connection between the way right. entitlements are shaped and uh, and the outcomes they're likely to have. So, right. um, so I hope your work goes forward very <laughs> fast in this area so we preserve the current system. I noticed that you have won a number of teaching awards and advising awards, and I can, uh, I, I'm sure you inspire so many students, not only in just teaching them the right kind of public finance approaches to take, but 
also in terms of how to go about um, having a career in this area. What mm. do you advise students if they want to get into this area? What would you tell them? What kind of training should they have? What do you think they should do to be successful like you've been in this field? Well, one thing I've really learned, I've spent most of my career in an economics department, and I'm an economist, and you know, obviously I'm quite applied and you know, interested in this policy space where there's a very interdisciplinary tradition that's been present for decades and decades. And I think now that I also have an appointment and my anchor appointment is in a policy school, I'm, I'm even more um, drawn into an interdisciplinary setting. So on the one hand, I obviously love economics and think it has <laughs> an incredible power and set of tools in order to kind of address these kinds of problems. But the more that I learn right now, the more that I think that our real ability to, for example, to learn more about the relationship between protection for children and access to nutrition and these investments in the long run, I find myself spending a lot of time with uh, developmental psychologists and others who really understand more about these processes than yeah. I do. Oh, yeah. And so I don't think there's any one sort of academic road, but I do think that one needs to follow the things that they're really interested in. And I, I don't think it takes much to convince students of that today. Yeah. I feel like m back when I remember being in grad school and thinking about the choices, I felt like I had to be really strategic about <laughs> what is it that I should be studying and is that going to create the right splash and all those things that one thinks about as, a, as part of your career. And one of the things that's so refreshing today is that people really, I think, this, especially from undergraduates all the way up, are very much following the things that really really are drawing them into the kinds of questions that they want to look at. And it's that passion and commitment that I think leads us to do our best work. And so that's, that's one that's thing it. that I always try to do. How many times as a PhD student, you know, sat in the chair across <laughs> from me and say, well, I'm really interested in X, but I feel like Y is the really hot area. And, you know, I, I've always sort of been one to say, you know, just follow the thing that you're really interested in, because I suspect you'll do your best work in that area. That's, um, and it'll probably be satisfying to you in that way. So <laughs> that's great That's advice. one thing. <laughs> yeah, and I think a lot of students are, are real solution-oriented on these big, difficult topics There's now. So no it's question great, about it. great advice. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to your talk and to sharing your talk with the public. So thanks so much for coming. Thanks to for inviting Stanford. me.